Hey, everybody. It's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Welcome. Hopefully you are in the right spot. Many folks still coming into the room. Uh, happy to have you with us on a Tuesday afternoon on the East Coast and morning on the West Coast where our presenter is. Uh, grateful to have you all with us. We're going to follow a practice we've been keeping now for, gosh, certainly since the pandemic, so a couple of years now, an idea that we borrowed from Professor Brene Brown down at the University of Houston, and that's that two-word check-in. If you've been with us before, you know how this works. You're going to type into the chat function, uh, if you would, and before you hit send, you're going to make sure you're sending this to everybody. Hey, Macarena from Chile. All right, everybody else, hold off for one quick minute. Type in your name, where you're coming in from, and then in two words, you can just describe how you're doing right this minute. And we know there's a range of how folks are feeling. But go ahead and type that in. And I'm going to tell you to hit send or return in just a quick minute. But hi, see if I can model it for you. It's Sean in DC, happy and intrigued. Let's see. And everybody else, go ahead. There we go. Wow, lots of folks coming through. See if I can grab a few. Sophia from Chicago, Nazreen in the Bronx, Rachel in Chattanooga, Mary. New oh, you guys are going way too fast for me. Suffice to say, you can see this for yourself. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Megan, Aaron, Cindy, Tanya, Keith. I think I saw you there for a quick minute, my friend. Deb, uh, Beverly in Wyoming and feeling exhausted. I'm sorry. Hopefully a nap headed your way. I know there's a lot going on in the world just now. Caroline, Angela, Jonathan, Richard, Lisa, Sarah, tired and Laurel. How are you? Guillermo. Uh, where are you in Monterey and Austin? That's awesome. Happy to have you all with us. So keep going in there, gang. Say hello to each other if you see names that you recognize. But let's go ahead. I'm going to take you through just a couple of quick pieces of housekeeping. I also want to, because I forgot to do this last time, I want to make sure I thank Kenya. She's offering interpretation services, sign services just up above me. You can see her there. And I'm going to try to talk slowly for my friend Kenya. Okay. The first thing you need to know is come Friday, we will have reached our deadline for the Clarence B. Jones Impact Award. Chances are, if you know the network, you know what this is all about. For the last going on now five years, we've been looking to celebrate and lift up a communications effort by an individual and organization that has been transformative. And so examples that we've pointed to in the past that we've given the award to are the folks at the Wonderful Truth Initiative, the Truth Campaign, that anti-smoking effort. Uh, we've also rewarded Desmond Mead for his extraordinary work in extending voting rights down with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. We've had our friends from the Step Ahead Chattanooga helping to have a conversation about a woman's right to choose in Appalachia uh, and down there in Knoxville, Tennessee, Chattanooga area. Uh, beyond that, who else have we gotten? Uh, just last year, an amazing story about influencing the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the work of the mighty but fairly small two-person comm shop at the amazing organization United We Dream. And so happy to have your nominations. You can find out all you need to know at the jonesaward.org. That's the URL. Taking nominations now, it's simple and easy. Maybe it takes you 10 minutes of your time. And it'll give us all an opportunity to look at sort of an archive where we've built up an archive of organizations that have really created impact with comms being sort of the strategic lever to change hearts and minds and shift our culture and policies. Okay, so with that, if we could go ahead, Kareem Alston is manning the deck for us. The other thing, as you can see here, we got a deadline coming up for this. A little bit more time for you here, in which case this is the end of May or towards the end of May. And this is that Corel Scholarships. We're mindful. Not everybody has the bank account of the Ford Foundation. So thanks to our friends at the Rockefeller Foundation, we're able to make 25 scholarships available to come join us in Seattle. Uh, the requirement is you have to work for a nonprofit or a uh, you work as an academic. So perhaps Ian will be able to join us, but suffice to say, we're grateful to have the Frank Corral Scholarship available and we're handing those out. Special note for folks in Seattle, Pacific Northwest area, we're holding back 12 of them just for you. I wanna make sure that since we're gonna be in your backyard, we're taking care of folks in the community. And so uh, go ahead and, and sign up for that. You can learn more about that as you can see there, comnet22.org backslash Corral. So just get to comnet22 and you'll find it. All right, Mr. Kareem, if you'll take us forward. Y'all hopefully know about this as well. The network has gotten pretty big over the last few years. There's 3,000 of us now. That means sometimes you're looking for that needle in the haystack. Who else is working on fill in the blank or has, as you can see here, these circles are about building your network within the network. And we really kind of parse them in three ways. So it's based on a shared identity, could be based on a shared job role. Maybe you are one of those people who are leading a team, as you can see there, or maybe it's about an issue area that you're working on. But suffice to say, we're grateful to have everybody uh, joining and these have been just fantastic. They gather monthly by Zoom and then in between they're talking to each other on Slack. So it is literally like having a kitchen cabinet in your back pocket or your phone or device, but we're happy to have you join. It's only for network members, but we're happy to have you with us. 
Mr. T, or excuse me, Kareem, actually, if you would take this forward. It's the other thing, this is free for everybody. These are the local groups that are gathering. And recently, in real life, our DC group just gathered last weekend, did a beautiful thing. They went out and did a, a park cleanup in Washington, DC, and got together about a dozen folks, which was just fantastic. But if you see these little blue dots, if you live near one of those, there's a local group nearby. And sometimes you just need to borrow a cup of sugar. Your neighbors can help. And that's what locals are all about. So with that, Let's go ahead. I think we got, it's my turn now to introduce, uh, and I'm very delighted to do this, the uh, Earl Warren, uh, Justice Earl Warren, Professor of Law at Berkeley, uh, Professor Ian Haney Lopez, who's going to talk to us about an issue that I think many of us are struggling with, which is that national conversation we're having right now about racial justice, about equity. Many of us inside of our organizations are thinking, how can I communicate on behalf of my organization or for my boss or with others on the team and do so in a way that doesn't cause harm. What we're going to do today is set a little context for all of this. Where do these conversations come from? What are some of the sort of background that's sort of feeding the, the, the sort of atmosphere in which we're all operating, the world in which we're all operating? One other note, as you all know, the network is a nonpartisan organization. We don't put our finger down on the slide either way, but we do obviously try to live out our values, which is why we're having this conversation. But if Ian strays into some language where he says Democrats or Republicans, uh, let's just remember what he's really talking about is more ideological polls, people who may sort of self-describe as liberal or progressive, and people who might be self-described conservative. So we're not really thinking about political parties today, but if that does come up, let's just all give each other a little bit of grace. So with that, Ian, over to you, sir, and I'm going to turn off my video. You're in good hands with Kenya and Ian. We'll see you all in a little bit. Oh yeah, one last thing, sorry. One last thing, and that is we're not going to take questions till the very end. So you can put them in the QA box. But what we are going to do is Ian's going to be very kind and follow this new thing that we're doing. We're going to have office hours. So he'll make himself available for about 30 minutes at the end of this presentation. And during that time, we'll send you a link. You can join us there and you can ask your questions or just hang out and have a listen to what other people are talking about. We did this last time. It ended up being a really rich, wonderful conversation. And we're grateful that Ian's willing to do that. So with that, I am going to turn off my video and now over to you, Ian. Thanks again, Ken. Thank you, Sean, and uh, thanks so much to the Communications Network and um, for giving me this opportunity to talk with you all. Thank you all for being here. Um, you can see the agenda. It looks like it's going to be full of bad news and, you know, hey, welcome to 2022. But here's what I really want to focus on. We can start to think about um, how to effectively speak persuasively in this moment to build a set a sense of shared responsibility of linked fate of of cross racial uh, solidarity there really is good news now one thing i want to make clear this good news this ability to build a sense of a social solidarity it has a lot to do with how we talk about what's happening to us and how we explain our relationships to each other. But at the same time, I don't wanna frame this just as a communication strategy. I worry that if it's, just, if it's understood as a communication strategy, that the underpinnings of it are too easy to lose sight of. So I'm really gonna talk about this as a fusion movement a sort of a fusion movement of all of our interests. Let's get started. Here's the challenge. Um, we're being demonized. We're being purposefully divided. We're being demonized. I've got these slides up here. A Couple of things I wanna say, Walmart, Disney, like the largest corporation in the world, the friendly mouse, these are being demonized for a white supremacy system or now being demonized for supposedly sexualizing and grooming children. So a couple of comments. This is culture war politics that has historically targeted people of color, um, vulnerable groups, Muslim communities, immigrants, but now it's extending to the largest corporations, I would say the largest foundations also, like just about everything is being sucked into this vortex of cultural politics. Comment one. Comment two, the cultural politics we're living is I think 
at sort, sort of primarily one that's been focused on racial panic. And I'm going to focus in my talk on intentional racial division and on purposefully creating cross-racial solidarity. But I don't mean to imply that this is exclusively about race. It's not. This is a strategy of intentionally stoking social divisions. Race is among the deepest and most harmful in the United States, but gender is there. Panic about sexual orientation, sexual preference, sexual identity is there. Panic about religion or about immigration status. So this is a part of a general culture war strategy. And I want us to keep both of those things in mind. Okay. Here's the other thing I want us to keep in mind. What we're seeing now is new on one level, the degree, the virulence, the sort of the conspiracy theories, the, the whole viciousness of it. But on another, it's actually has, it actually has roots that go back 60 years. And going back to those roots, going back to 1964, that's important to our effort to understand what's happening now and to our effort to understand how we might respond effectively. So 1964, this is a landslide victory for Lyndon Johnson, Democratic candidate for president. What did he campaign on? Well, the summer before the election, he'd signed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So he's very strongly in favor of civil rights. In addition, he was promising to end poverty in a decade, he was saying, hey, listen, 1976 is going to be the bicentennial of the country. What better way to celebrate 200 years of American history than to use the awesome powers of the federal government to end poverty for everybody in the country? And he won in a landslide. So who's this Barry Goldwater? And what's happening down here? Barry Goldwater is a Republican candidate, but he wasn't a typical Republican. He was more reactionary than conservative. And here's the distinction I'm making. Conservatives, and frankly, many people who describe themselves as liberal are in fact conservative in this little c sense. Conservatives believe in social progress, but want to slow it down, want to make sure that there's due regard for social uh, institutions, for traditions that as we progress, we take our time, we think about it, we proceed gradually, incrementally. Reactionaries, in contrast, are willing to tear down major social institutions, want to go back to an imagined preferred time, and are quite revolutionary in their willingness to trash social institutions, to trash traditions, to completely rearrange a uh, social structure. Barry, that was Barry Goldwater. Unlike Dwight Eisenhower, for example, who expanded Social Security as a Republican, Barry Goldwater believed in the old ideal that the rich should be the main engine of social progress and that democracy too often impeded the ability of the wealthy to lead society. And that the real goal of democratic governance was to structure the marketplace in a way that favored the accumulation of wealth and then to otherwise get out of the way. Low taxes on the rich, no programs of upward mobility for the great majority, um, uh, no regulations of the marketplace designed to protect labor or the environment. In other words, Barry Goldwater was a throwback to a pre-New Deal robber baron type ethos that said, release the awesome power of the market, don't constrain the wealthy. As people accumulate wealth, they will be our best leaders and everybody else needs to simply get out of the way. Now, in, 19, in the 1960s, the Great Depression produced by that sort of political ethos was still very clearly in the rearview mirror. And you could see that with that sort of an argument, Goldwater was going to lose and lose in a massive landslide. And yet, what the heck? Because 
this is the deep South that he's about to win five states in and, and Arizona because, okay, he's the sort of local son. He's from a wealthy retail family in Arizona, but also it's Arizona. But the deep South, diehard Democrats, diehard fans of the New Deal, the New Deal, uh, um, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, it had brought electricity to most of the South, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and Goldwater was proposing to dismantle, to break it up. And yet they voted for him. Why? Because Goldwater sensed a sea change in American politics. He could see that with the civil rights movement in the 1950s, more and more Southern Democrats, which is to say Southern white Democrats, because to that point, the Democratic Party in the South had largely completely disenfranchised African-Americans. Goldwater could see that they were more and more agitated by civil rights. They were more and more upset by the notion of racial equality. And he devised a strategy. It would not be a strategy of open appeals to white supremacy. Again, this is in the midst of the civil rights movement. One of the great successes of the civil rights movement was to convince the nation that open appeals to white supremacy, the use of racial epithets, uh, um, naked claims of white dominance or the, the, the superiority of whites, the great success of the civil rights movement, one of them was to convince the nation that that was immoral, that it was ugly, that it was a grievous sin to insist that white people were superior to black people. So Goldwater wouldn't say that. Instead, he would dog whistle. He would use coded terms that on their surface didn't reference race at all, but that were intentionally designed to communicate, to trigger strong racial reaction, reactions. So for example, Goldwater would uh, talk about states' rights and now, states' rights, I like on its surface, that sounds like federalism, state federal relations, uh, okay. But everybody knew in the 1960s, states' rights meant the right of Southern states to resist the federal order that they desegregate or have this mental image in mind. Goldwater campaigned across the South by going to football stadiums. And before he would arrive, he would arrange to have young white women high, in high school or in college dress in formal white ball gowns. And they would line the football field. And then among them, he would scatter tens of thousands of white lilies. And then Goldwater would go out onto the football field and motion at all these young white women in white gowns surrounded by white lilies and say, this is what we're fighting for. This is what we're voting on. Did he mention black? Did he mention white? No. Was the power of the racial message there? Absolutely. And this was the warning. This was the warning that the most diehard Democrats, those most committed to activist government to lift up the majority, could nevertheless be convinced to vote for a reactionary politician committed to dismantling activist government if appealed to in racial terms. 1968, Richard Nixon had spoken out against Barry Goldwater. Richard Nixon was a moderate Republican in 1963, watching uh, Barry Goldwater's politics develop. Nixon had said, this is gonna be a disaster for the Republican party. If we do this, we will betray Lincoln's legacy and become a party of white men only. But late in his campaign for, 19, in, in, for president in 1968, worried about getting insufficient votes in the South, Nixon started to use some of Goldwater's language. He won just barely in 1968. He still wasn't sure about this dog whistle strategy. But number crunchers on the Republican and Democratic side said yes, coded re racial appeals can restructure American electoral politics can realign the white working class, shifting them from one party to another, shifting them from 
the party of the New Deal to the party of big business. So Nixon, beginning in 1970, leaned into dog whistle politics. He talked about states' rights. He talked about law and order and crime in the street. He talked about the victimization of the silent majority. And how did he do? Eight years after Lyndon Johnson won in a landslide promising to end poverty in America in a dozen years, just eight years later, Richard Nixon won in an even bigger landslide. And this is the moment, this transition, these eight years have really reset the trajectory of American politics. I don't wanna suggest that 1972 is all about race. There's unrest on the campus, unrest in the streets, um, uh, the, the um, uh, Vietnam War, the feminist movement, there's a lot going on, but, 1964, when Lyndon Johnson won, that was the last time a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote. And with Richard Nixon, and then moving on to, to Ronald Reagan, you're seeing not just a shift in the Democratic Party, but a shift in the Republican Party. Richard Nixon had been Dwight Eisenhower's vice president. He was, had been a moderate Republican. He had believed in the power of the federal government to actually lift up the majority. But realizing that to win on racial issues, he was gonna to have to campaign against the federal government and its enforcement of integration. He also began to campaign against the federal government in terms of its economic policies. And even more so, Ronald Reagan, who would win in 1980, Reagan got his start in politics as a spokesperson for Barry Goldwater and believed in Goldwater's strategy of using racial resentment to build opposition to government's economic policies. And so here I really want to pick up on the partisan, not partisan. This is a story of a remarkable transformation in our politics and conservative, liberal, New Deal, they all are changing meaning in this era and they're changing meaning in connection to race. It's very often said that we are an economically conservative country. I just don't think that's true. I think more than anything, we're a racially fearful country. And that's what you see here in 1972, setting the trajectory of the next 50 years. And here's what you see in, in 2022. I have up here a quick quote from Christopher Rufo. It's instructive to look at Rufo. Rufo is the uh, sort of uh, one of the architects behind the attacks on critical race theory, describing it as a woke ideology. He is now one of the principal movers behind the attacks on, on Disney, describing it as sexualizing and grooming children. He knows, he knows that he's lying. This is his boast. The goal is to have pu the public read something crazy in the newspaper and think critical race theory. We've decodified the term. In other words, we've deconnected the term from reality and recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions. Rufo has boasted publicly, I'm gonna make this garbage up. And yet it works. It works for Rufo himself, who's landed a position as a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. It works for, and to be clear, the Manhattan Institute, which promotes greater economic choice and individual responsibility. The Manhattan Institute is one of these reactionary think tanks pushing out uh, policy papers arguing for Barry Goldwater's economic royalist vision. Why are, this why are these sort of economic reactionary think tanks supporting Chris Rufo? Because they know, like Rufo, that through division, you build power, you increase, and then you protect your profits. This is what we're living now. This is why there's so much energy behind the culture wars. The culture wars are not primarily grassroots. Yes, there's grassroots anxiety about shifting status and changing cultural norms, 
But the virulence of the moral panics sweeping the country now, the moral panics that have swept the country for the last 50 years, the virulence comes because some of the most powerful, wealthiest people in the country invest in social strife as their strategy to increase their power, to increase their profits. Next part of the talk, it's still dog whistle politics. And here's what I wanna get at here. Here's my worry. A lot of us, when we listen to these divisive messages about critical race theory or about woke Disney um, or about illegal aliens or Muslim terrorists, we see through it quickly. And we assume that most people see through it quickly as well. And then when you see so much of the country nevertheless vote for it, we come to this paralyzing, demoralizing conclusion. The conclusion that we're a nation of bigots and haters, that we're a nation that hears clearly these lies, these racist, misogynistic, homophobic lies, hears them clearly for what they are and supports them. Is that true? Take a look at this message. Read this message. This is a message that I tested in the summer of 2020. It's purposefully designed to pick up a lot of the language from the right-wing echo chamber. As you read this message, I want you to ask, how many people are gonna find this convincing? How many people are gonna respond warmly or positively to this message? And I want you to ask a second question. Is there gonna be a racial dynamic here? Are some racial groups going to really like this message, but others gonna repudiate it? Take a moment to think about those two questions. So I read this message to folks, gave them a dial. They could dial up if they felt warmly towards the message. They could dial down if they disliked the message, if they felt coldly towards it, weren't persuaded. The dial ran from zero to 100, 50 was neutral. So anything above 50 is people feeling warmly. Anything below 50 is people feeling coldly or negatively about this message. How would people react? Would there be a racial dynamic? This is the stunning news. You might say to yourself, well, this is a message that's gonna be convincing to most whites. And indeed it is, there's that 60. But then you might have said to yourself, but African-Americans, they're gonna see through this. They're gonna see through that garbage language of places overrun with drugs and crime. They'll know the code. You might have said to yourself, Latinos, they're not gonna fall for this poisonous language about uh, illegal aliens. They found this message just about as convincing as whites. And here's this other group that I want you to focus on for a second, persuadable voters, all races. The United States ideologically is largely divided into two groups. Progressives who feel warmly towards people of color, believe government has a role in regulating the marketplace, uh, think that the rich are rich mainly because of circumstances um, and that there should be routes of upward mobility created for all of us, and a more reactionary mindset that is racially fearful, that believes the best government is the most limited government, and that thinks that there's something special about the rich, that they're rich because of their individual capacity, and that the rest of us would be better off emulating them rather than trying to regulate the marketplace. Those two groups are about one-fifth of the United States on each side, one-fifth. Slightly fewer on the right, slightly more on the left, but more or less one-fifth believing in the sort of reactionary vision, one-fifth believing in the progressive vision. These folks, the 60% in the middle, they are not in a considered middle. They are not centrist. Get that image out of our heads. They are conflicted. 
They believe elements of both stories. Sometimes they toggle between both stories, even within the same breath. They can be easily pushed or pulled in either direction. They often respond to whoever spoke with them last. They like this message. This is what we're up against. Here's the next thing I want to say, just to be clear. There was only one group that truly, truly hated this message. Those of us engaged professionally in politics, organizing, and philanthropy. Professionally. We hated this message. We listened to it. We're like, we know the game. We know the con. We hear the racism. We, some people broke their wrists dialing down, hated it. We were the only group. Majority of Republicans loved it. Majority of Democrats loved it. Majority of union households loved it. This is a test that I did. These are the results from July, 2020. We've done other tests with Asian Americans and Native Americans, similar results. Those of us who work in the field professionally, we can see the con, we can, we can pierce the rhetoric, but the vast majority of our fellow citizens cannot. It's still dog whistle politics. And by saying it's still dog whistle politics, what I mean to communicate is these are messages designed to trigger strong racist reactions, but to allow people to hear them as instead common sense. And that's what you're seeing here. This is just common sense for the majority of Americans. They do not hear the racism or the misogyny or the homophobia. They don't hear it. They hear common sense. A quick overview of the different sorts of dog whistles to give you a sense of a little bit of how what, what's changed. Since the 1970s, a threat script, the physical threat script, the crime, the scarcity script, welfare, right? That we have welfare queens, we have an entitlement mentality. Right now we're in the midst of what I'm calling the revenge script. It's really important to you all. The revenge script says those people demanding equality, those people denouncing racism, those people trumpeting inclusion, they don't want any of those things really. What they really want is revenge. When people say Black Lives Matter, they mean white lives don't matter. The 1619 Project, that's really about slamming white people. Critical race theory isn't about fighting racism. It's actually about stoking race hatred. Equity and inclusion, that's just woke politics to try and put white people in their, in their place and make them feel guilty. It's all about revenge. That's the new rhetoric we're facing. And that's, this is the sort of, you know, it, it attacks on Walmart, attacks on Disney. It's not going to go away. Attacks on philanthropy, they're not going to go away. This is the new sort of dog whistle script for, for 2020, 2021, for 2022. It's accelerating. This is what we're facing. So how are we going to respond? Here, I'm going to pivot a little bit and say, in order to understand how we should respond, we need to understand how we're understanding racism. We need to take a look at the way we're conceptualizing racism. This here, this is a tweet from J.D. Vance. He's a political candidate in Ohio, um, um, used to run as a populist, now he's running as an economic populist. Now he's running as a racial populist. He starts this recent tweet with a video and the video starts by saying, are you a racist? Do you hate Mexicans? Because that's what Democrats say when we talk about building a wall and securing the Southern border. Notice what he's doing. He's not waiting for anybody to attack him for being a racist. He's making front and center this revenge script. He's saying, I'm being attacked as a racist when all I want to do is protect the border. And any of you who want to protect the border, you're being attacked as a racist too. So how should we respond? Should we say, hey, JD, you're right. You are a racist. You know he wants that. You know that plays into his hand. Should we do it anyway? Or maybe we should say, 
hey, JD, we're not going to play your game. We're not going to call you racist. We're going to ignore racism. And instead, we're going to focus on policy issues that unite everybody. Sounds plausible. But what JD Vance is telling you with this tweet is his main strategy is to provoke racial anxiety and racial resentment. If that's his main strategy, how well are we going to do if we say, well, we're just going to ignore your main strategy. We won't address it. We won't talk about it. And here's what I want to suggest. This division, condemn the racism or ignore the racism, it's a division that is pervasive in the broader liberal progressive movement. I suspect it's a division that's well represented within philanthropy itself. I think it's a division that's rooted in how we're understanding racism. So here I'm gonna step back a little bit and, and uh, j just to give you a little bit of context, this is where you'll see that I am a critical race theorist. I've been a critical race theorist for years. I, I teach at the University of California, Berkeley. I teach race in American law. I teach constitutional law. I teach critical race theory as a seminar. I've been thinking deeply about how racism works through law for decades. And for decades, this was my model. For decades, this was my, my, my model. I said to myself, what is racism? And I said, at root, at root, racism is a hierarchy of whites over people of color. Now, as a critical race theorist, I knew that it was connected to gender and to class and to other sorts of social hierarchies. I knew that um, uh, other people of color fit in here in complicated ways, right? Like I, I get all, there's a ton of nuance, ton of nuance that I've stripped away because I wanna communicate that I think I, and I think many of you have this understanding and, and we have this understanding at, the, at, at a level of a paradigm. And here by paradigm, I mean, a sort of a taken for granted assumption that we haven't closely analyzed, that we didn't, we just sort of like absorbed, yes, racism is basically white over non-white hierarchy. Now I wanna move from there to say, what does this suggest about our theory of social change, social movement building, and then by implication, communications? This is, probably a pretty complicated slide, but I wanna work through it. These are the reactionary folks. This is J.D. Vance. This is um, Steve Bannon. This is Stephen Miller. This is Fox News. They love, they love, they promote a message of racial conflict between whites and people of color. This is essentially what they hope to communicate through dog whistle coded terms. This is the great replacement theory. We as a country are locked into racial battle. Some racial group must come out on top, pick a side. And so when liberals and progressives say, well, we need to take care of people of color, the right says, told you so told you so, that's it, right? They, they love this vision. What about those of us deeply concerned with racial justice? And here, let me speak in personal terms, though I suspect most of you, this will resonate. You'll, you'll, you'll hear what I'm saying. For years, I thought, well, if racism is at root whites over people of color, what that means is that most whites benefit from racism, most whites will defend it. Maybe they'll defend it by denying it, by obfuscating it, by pretending it doesn't exist, but the majority of whites will not join a fight to actually end white over non-white hierarchy. There will be some white allies. Most of the folks in this room who are white, they're gonna be white allies, but they're gonna be exceptional. We're gonna lose the majority of white support. And then I said to myself, then we'll lose the majority of white support. That's what it is. That's just the situation we're in. We must demand racial justice even if this alienates the majority of white folks. Now over here, 
you get people who say, hey, we need to be pragmatic. We need to be realistic. The truth is white people are still the dominant group. They still hold the vast bulk of power in this society. If we lose white support, we cannot achieve anything. It's better therefore, and you might hear this argument in terms of popularism uh, from someone like David Shore, you might hear it in the philanthropic world with people saying, listen, race is super divisive. It's the third rail, stay away from it. Why don't we focus on something like literacy or public health or infrastructure or education reform where we can actually get things done that'll be good for everybody, including for people of color, but always let's be careful not to prioritize racial justice because that's how we're going to end up losing white support, right? Like you might've heard that language. This is a position that says, and again, highly simplified, we're gonna retain white support even if that means we need to stop talking about racial justice. And this here, this division, I think is what's paralyzing progressives and liberals right now. We're busy fighting each other with some folks saying, we have to talk about racial justice. And then other folks responding by saying, stop talking about racial justice so much. You're dividing us. We're, you know, we're losing support. Tamp it down. You know, minimize it. Push it to the back burner. We're going to focus on these other things that are going to help you too. And then the racial justice folks come back and say, you're the problem. You're betraying our core values. And we, we're busy fighting each other. And these folks are laughing. Now I want to suggest a paradigm change. And I want to suggest a paradigm change partly because this is going to be important in terms of our social movement building. But first, and but first to begin with, and as important, I want to suggest a paradigm change because I think it's analytically more accurate. I think it's, I think it's a more compelling, more complete story of how racism actually works in America. And by suggesting this new paradigm, I wanna be really clear. I'm not claiming in 2022, I'm inventing something new. I'm actually trying to recover, to, to reinvigorate, to bring back an older, more radical conception of racism, the sort of conception of racism that pulled together newly emancipated African-Americans and the white poor immiserated by slavery in the South in the so-called fusion movement. The vision of racism of people like W.E.B. Du Bois, of people like Martin Luther King late in his career when he was talking about a poor people's movement that must simultaneously fight racism, capitalism, and militarism. The militant understanding of racism of Fred Hampton, the labor understanding of racism of people like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, who understood racism is at root class warfare. It's not always class warfare. It, it, it's, it becomes independent of it in, in many different ways, but at root, racism is a strategy of the wealthy and the powerful to turn us against each other so that we cannot pull together to fight them. It's a strategy that succeeds by promoting white over people of color hierarchy. In other words, the hierarchy is there. It's virulent, it's vicious, it's pervasive. Yes, we need to look at that hierarchy, but then we also need to look behind it. Who's promoting it? What's their strategy? Why are they doing it? How do they profit? And I want to suggest, again, I want to reiterate, this is, I think, standalone, a more compelling understanding of racism across the entire history of the United States. And now I want to go on to suggest it also has very important implications in terms of social movement building. Start over here with the racial justice folks. What caused, for example, mass incarceration? What has caused the demonization of migrants? The answer is not white racism in general. The answer is dog whistle politics, a strategy among politicians of promoting racial fe of fear as a route to power. So if you really wanna end 
mass incarceration, racialized mass incarceration, if you really want to end mass deportation, you want to end mass surveillance of Muslim communities, your enemy is not white people in general. Your enemy is those folks who intentionally stoke fear and division as a strategy for political power and economic profit. And likewise, let's say you do want good health care or effective policies promoting, uh, protecting the environment or policies that promote and enhance the power of labor to organize and bargain collectively. Say you want any of those things that on their face don't seem racial. You have to recognize that the main political weapon that has completely realigned American politics over the last 50 years is intentional racial division. And you can't get, you cannot get any of these seemingly non-racial policy advances unless you defeat those who intentionally stoke racial fear and division and other culture war fears. In other words, these folks and these folks have a shared enemy and need to tell a story that says, we're being intentionally divided. And only when we recognize that and build power together can everybody, whatever color you are, take care of your own family. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Here's an immigration message that I tested summer of 2020. Whether it's from another town or another country, most of us move for the same reason. We're all in this together. We're all pretty similar. But especially during COVID-19, certain politicians are insulting immigrants while billions are going to a handful of corporations. The richest 1% benefit when politicians blame immigrants for the hard times regular people face. We need to recognize the contributions of immigrants in our communities and states and embrace people with the courage to move. When we come together, we can elect new leaders who put fairness back into our immigration laws and make this a country that provides a better life for everyone, whether we're brown, black, or white. Notice the structure of this message. It does not debate the humanity of immigrants. It does not condemn white racism. It does not say we need to reform immigration to help immigrant families. It says, notice the con. The biggest threat in all of our lives, no matter what race we are, are those who promote fear of immigrants while they laugh all the way to the bank. And the solution is to come together so that we can take care of all of our own families. And now look at the results. Persuadable voters, all races. This message is more convincing than the dog whistle fear message that you listened to earlier. Latinos, more convincing. African-Americans, more convincing. Uh, one thing I wanna add here, the right has succeeded in convincing many African-Americans that new immigrants are an economic threat to them. Here's a story that says to African-Americans, that's a bunch of baloney. That's the lie that will actually hurt you. Join together to help, to, to sort of build power and take care of your own family. Join with immigrants to take care of your own black family. Here's the other thing I wanna emphasize. This is truly, truly, truly a startling result. Whites have been told for 50 years, immigrants are a direct threat. They're illegals, they're criminal illegals. They're pouring across the border. They're bringing knives, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing disease. And the first time, the first time they hear this divide and conquer message, they say, that's equally as convincing. These are truly, truly impressive results. And, and I'm gonna summarize here and then we're gonna actually watch a few videos to show how this works in a way that isn't as stilted as these sort of message testing results uh, um, uh, present them. There's really good news here. The really good news is 
there's a message that already resonates with the vast majority of Americans, a message that brings us together. It's a message that says divide and conquer is the threat we all face. And when we reject divide and conquer messages and join with others, we can make this a country that's more just and also take care of our own families. And hear that pragmatic element, take care of our own families, no matter what we look like. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask Kareem to, to help me out. He's gonna play a series of videos. First video is going to be uh, Amber, giving us a sense of what this looks like. Whether you're a black working class woman in Columbus, Ohio, or a white father in Kentucky, or a Latina student in Phoenix, it is the same ruling class using the same played out tactics to make us hate each other based on race, gender, religion, and sexuality. They are trying to make us point fingers in the wrong direction while we're all struggling and they are thriving. And we're struggling to build the families that we want with access to the healthcare that we need, provided by the jobs that bring us joy in order to manage the crippling debt from those fun yet incredibly expensive degrees that we kind of don't really use. We gotta change who's in charge. It's time to give someone else a chance. And it's on all of us to actually support and cheer on a new generation of leaders. We choose us. We choose us. Don't you choose us? I would choose us. Like, I mean, us. Duh. I love Amber. All right. So here's what I want to emphasize. A couple of things. Young multiracial audience. But notice, and again, this is really important. Notice this isn't a sort of like Coca-Cola. We're young. We're multiracial. We're hip. Let's all, you know, go to a dance party together. This is a pragmatic message. This is a message that says we're being divided. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, or where you find yourself, we're being divided. Come together, choose us. Listen to the pragmatism of this. Again, I really wanna emphasize this. This is a two-part message. We're being divided, come together. If all Amber were saying is come together, people would say, yeah, that's nice but that's not reality. Those folks are a threat to me. It's when Amber says, that's their strategy. Their strategy is division, come together. That all of a sudden come together is not just joyful and moral and righteous. It's also the pragmatic way forward. Okay, so that's Amber, young, multicultural, California, Oakland-based. Now let's go, uh, Kareem, if you could help with the next video, Minnesota. In Minnesota, we know long winters, and we know how to dig our neighbors out of the snow. Because whether it's our first Minnesota winter or our 50th, we've all been there. So when certain politicians want to divide us and make us afraid, we know that means they've got nothing else to offer. We're on to them. There are lots of ways to be Minnesotan, and all of them are greater than fear. In Minnesota, we're better off together. Vote greater than fear between now and November 6th. Love this, love this. This is a 2018 ad. Um, so um, uh, in 2017, I pulled together a group, Anat Shankar Osorio, a communication specialist, Heather McGee, a former student who's just like an amazing superstar. Love her book, The Sum of Us, by the way. You might've read it. If you haven't, you definitely should. Um, Anat went on to work with some Minnesota groups they devised this campaign. Notice again, a couple of points. One, this is clearly identifying division as the strategy that threatens everybody before presenting this sort of multiracial, joyful uh, a vision of a shared meal. Um, two, notice this is really, this is the same message but now it's designed to address a majority white electorate. And it's a sort of, it's a, it's a very positive message, um, greater than fear, very, very clever slogan. In Minnesota, greater Minnesota was the way in which people talked about rural Minnesota to distinguish it from Minneapolis, St. Paul, the multiracial cities. So picking up the greater Minnesota and saying greater than fear, 
a very smart move, I should also say, on the strength of this message. So this, this race class fusion message in Minnesota was a, originally picked up by labor and faith groups. And it was so successful, the Democratic Party then got behind it and did very well in 2018 using this message. And, and again, to emphasize, you've got Amber in urban Oakland, young, multiracial. You've got greater than fear in Minnesota, majority white, aimed at a rural audience. Again, incredibly effective. One last video I want to show you, a video that takes seriously the idea that most of our communities are in fact heterogeneous and diverse. Go ahead, Karim. Thank you. We may dance to different music and come in many colors, but, but we, we are, are all proud, proud of our Latino, our Latinx, our Hispanic heritage. And like everyone else, we, we want, want to take care of our families. But certain politicians and crooked corporations care more about profits than people. They even see COVID-19 as a way to make more money. They rig relief efforts in order to benefit themselves while telling us to blame China or immigrants trying to cross the Mexican border. Today, we say enough. enough. We know our diversity makes us interesting, beautiful, strong. We can build power with other groups by registering, voting, and electing leaders that will work for all of us, no matter our color, race, or ethnicity. Whether we're originally from up the street or from across the border, together, together juntos, we will make this a place where every family has a real opportunity to thrive. Let's vote. Juntos. Yes, here's what I want to say about that. We must lean into identity politics without insisting on a narrow definition of our shared identity. Notice what this, what this sort of ad, this, this Project Juntos ad is doing. It's saying divide and conquer threatens all of us. They're trying to weaponize our differences but we believe in each other across those differences. It leans into identity while welcoming every different identity. It says it doesn't matter our differences. What matters is that some people are trying to divide us, but we believe in each other. We believe in our beauty, our diversity, our strength, and only when we believe in each other and reject division can we build power together. Okay, um, Kareem, if you could go to that sort of, yes, all right, this is my concluding screen. I'm sorry there's no time for questions and answers in this session. I'm really excited by the office hours session that's going to come up uh, um, immediately after this, in which we'll have 30 minutes to go back and forth. Let me reiterate a, a couple of key uh, points here. First and foremost, I have to, sorry about that. First and foremost, this is a shift in how we think about racism and what's happening in society. At root, more than a communication strategy, this is a movement strategy. We're gonna understand race and class as fused. We're gonna see how they're linked together and we're gonna see that that means that racism is very often a threat to all of us, not in the same ways, but a threat to all of our families. Once we see that, we can see that by linking race and class or by linking class to these to a culture war more generally, we can sensitize people to the con. We can get them to have a frame for understanding all these culture war attacks in which people don't debate like, is, is, is Disney actually grooming people? Is Walmart actually engaged in, wo in, in woke politics? Are any of these philanthropies, when they say diversity and inclusion, are they really teaching anything? They stop debating that nonsense and start saying to themselves again, oh, there they go again, trying to promote fear and division to distract us from what's really happening, a massive shift of power and wealth into the stratosphere. This same approach, also, and this is very important, this same approach also builds majority support for racial justice initiatives. Because once you say to people, racial solidarity is the route forward, then people are much more open to the idea that solidarity is gonna require rejecting division and actually remedying ongoing harms and building 
an integrated society. Quickest, shortest version of all of this, they divide to conquer, we unite to build. 